We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Brown, your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we're really lucky to have as our guest, Charlie Gargiulo. Charlie Gargiulo is the founder of the Coalition for a Better Acre in Lowell, Massachusetts, and now the author of a book soon to be published in the spring of 2022, Farewell to Little Canada, a book about his life growing up in the neighborhood of Little Canada in Lowell, Massachusetts. We're gonna watch a five and a half minute clip from a movie, for Forging Affordable Housing Partnerships, that describes Charlie's work in the early 1980s building and founding the Coalition for a Better Acre. So take a look at this video or part of it. This neighborhood had a very bad reputation. It's not that way anymore. You know, things are very different from what they used to be. I think, you know, everybody's trying to do their best to, keep, to have it, to have it better neighborhood. Plagued by blight and arson throughout the 1970s, the Acre Triangle was easily the most decimated neighborhood in the city of Lowell, perhaps even in the state of Massachusetts. The Triangle's housing stock and infrastructure were suffering from years of neglect. Its streets and alleyways were a haven for crime and drug trafficking, and its people were disenchanted, disillusioned, and dispirited. You take your worst visions of what a slum is, and that was the Acre Triangle. A massive program of historic renovation in the nearby downtown area of the city created a stark and dramatic contrast to life in the Triangle, fueling real estate speculation and causing rents to skyrocket. This neighborhood, with its rich heritage as a gateway for new immigrants, stood abandoned and isolated left behind in a city whose revitalization was becoming a national success story. People who lived here for many years are the people who had to persevere when the city wasn't hot and now the city was going to be turned around. We felt that they should benefit from this revitalization since they were the people that worked the factories, that worked uh, to make this economy work. They should be benefiting from the revitalization, not being victims of that revitalization. It was when plans were announced to demolish the Triangle to make way for high-rise housing, but the Coalition for a Better Acre was formed. Everyone was convinced that the best thing for the Triangle was knocking everything down and starting over again. 
Mm. That had been their answer in Little Canada, and we know what occurred there. <clears throat> it was going to be their answer in the Triangle, and that too would have been disaster. This neighborhood belongs to the people that live in it. People here are working people. We are proud to live here. We are very proud of our community, and we want to work and make it better every day. The way to preserve a community is to involve its members, and not for an outside planner to come in and tell people in a poor community what's best for them, but to allow poor people themselves to be part of the decision-making that goes on with how to save and preserve their communities. The vision of the Coalition for a Better Acre was to assemble a revitalization plan for the Triangle that would improve and increase the area's housing stock without displacing current residents. At the same time, affecting a change in the spirit of the neighborhood by getting residents involved in planning their own destiny. We felt that's always been the missing ingredient uh, among uh, urban planners' uh, attempts to try and save communities uh, in the past is that it was always other people trying to put down and impose plans for people who lived in a particular community. We wanted to stop that, save the neighborhood, and, and empower people. The coalition began empowering people by mobilizing them in a fight to save the Acre Triangle from mass displacement and gentrification. Early on, it wasn't an easy task because no one wanted to listen to what we had to say and we had to literally fight in order to even be heard. But the coalition would make itself heard, taking its case to the steps and council chambers of City Hall. We got a clear message from the neighborhood that they wanted to have something happen in the Triangle, but that families should not be displaced. Jim Milanazzo was director of the Lowell Division of Planning and Development at the time of these early negotiations. We were convinced by the coalition that in fact you could do the Triangle project without displacing any of the, any of the families uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. We felt that at one point that if we went in there with a large urban renewal project, if you want to call it that, that, uh, that we would have been able to provide, yes, new buildings, but probably different families, families that did not have a stake in the neighborhood. As the coalition developed its own plan for the Triangle, it scored an early and very significant victory. Through involvement with the National Training and Information Center, the coalition secured the support and financial backing of Aetna Life and Casualty. At Aetna's corporate headquarters in Hartford, Vice President Sandy Cloud recalls the decision to include the Triangle in Aetna's National Neighborhood Investment Program. Hi, uh, we're back, and uh, wow, that was a powerful video. And we're really lucky to have Charlie, uh, 35 years later, still with us, still strong, still Long organizing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it beats the alternative, as my grandfather said. That's true. Uh, with us, and Charlie, so I wonder, uh, you've now written a book about your experience growing up in what was then Little Canada. Uh, and I know that had uh, a big impact on you as a young boy, as a 13-year-old and you tell the story in Fare Farewell Little Canada as a 13-year-old boy and wondering about what's going on. I wonder if you can describe uh, your background and what you learned then or what you, what you felt then. Sure, yeah, I know. Uh, the, the book is basically uh, my memoir growing up as a child. Uh, between 11 and 13 years old and 63 to 65, uh, we mm -hmm. moved into the Little Canada neighborhood of Lowell, which my mother had grown up in as a child and most of her family had grown up in, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, French Canadians uh, had moved to Lowell in around the 1880s, so my family had been on my mother's side in Lowell, uh, you know, around that time period they came to mm -hmm. work the mills of Lowell. And uh, it was a really tight-knit community, but it was a very poor community and it became slated for uh, a demolishment, uh, urban renewal, so-called, uh, urban removal of poor people uh, so that, uh, in, in that neighborhood of a the Acre and Lowell, and, uh, which I grew up in. And it was a devastating experience, and that's what I try to write about instead of like uh, saying why urban plan was bad, basically to try and see through the eyes of a child. What does it look like yeah. when there's outside forces that you don't even know can come in and basically right. literally take your home and the na homes of all of your neighbors and just remove you like you don't even exist. And uh, right. 
Uh, and I try to describe that experience and uh, because it, it was a devastating one. It destroyed yeah. uh, a lot of people. My Aunt Rose. Uh, yeah, you want to tell us, you know, what, what real effect, quote, urban renewal has on real people like your Aunt Rose? Well, yeah, my, my Aunt Rose literally died from the experience. I mean, she was 65 years old, had lived there all, literally all of her life. She was disabled. She had a club foot. And uh, she, her apartment was her life, and she loved it there. It was a, mm -hmm. a, a tight-knit community, and uh, she had lived there all her life. And I remember shortly before when it became clear that they literally were going to be taking us out and throwing us out and, remove, and destroying the neighborhood, uh, overhearing her one night talking uh, while she was praying, uh, with, saying her rosaries and praying, you know, dear God, please, you know, don't take my home because it will kill me. And, uh, and it did. You know, a week after, literally a week after, uh, she was forcibly removed. Uh, she died, and uh, and I try to convey that whole experience uh, because she was an amazing woman. You know, people don't understand the kind of people that you never hear or you never see. You know, everybody, you know, famous people. You know, this woman could have been a saint. You know, she she was such an influence over me, and nobody, you know even though she's existed. She was thrown out like she didn't, you know, she didn't even matter when the plans came through. And I, and I remember thinking, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? So 20 years later, yeah. when something similar was happening in the acre, this was, what, in the early 60s when your Aunt Rose dies. 20 years later, when you're a young man, uh, you saw what was happening again, and you actually organized to do something about it. I wonder if you can tell us, I mean, the movie shows a little bit about that, but I wonder if you can tell us more about the details of what you actually did and what was some of the organizing uh, lessons you, you, you learned there? Yeah, <clears throat> no, I think the, what I learned was at the time was wondering, you know, as a child, like, you, you know, the, you have to understand what the concept must have felt like, you know, growing up. And I remember hearing people, you know, like my aunt and everything, and my mother, when we ask asking the story, is this going to really happen? Is this, a, this can't happen here. This is America. You know, it's not like you can just come in and destroy your home, you know, and everything. And, and then slowly but surely, you know, he found out it actually did. And I was haunted by that whole experience, like I said, mm -hmm. wondering who did this. And it was, it was just this thing called Urban Renewal. We didn't even know who the people were, you know. Uh, and, and and all my life I wanted to know. So I mean, as I, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, I was I was lucky. I got well, I shouldn't say I was lucky, but I did when I was in the army. I was able to use a GI Bill, and I went to right. school. And one of the things I, when I went to school was to try to find out like what happened. You know, the urban plan. How do you stop these kinds of things from happening? How do you get people to know mm -hmm. about these things? And I realized it wasn't an accident. This was actually somebody's plan to do this. And right. you know, right. and I realized that there were forces of you know that that that. Uh, um, at play, uh, and when people are poor, and it was generally, you know, these were urban renewal plans all over the country, you know, we were just one of them. It was literally called black removal because it was mainly aimed at African American communities were mostly the ones that were victimized right. by this. We just happened to be one of those few <laughs> additional, like, you know, sometimes it hit poor white communities, and this French Canadian community was, uh, uh, happened to be the place where the land was of value and uh, we were no longer, right. uh, you know, we needed to be in their way. So I, I, I wanted to find out how to stop this. And, and you, because you were a U.S. Army veteran, you were able to use the GI Bill, Bill. to go to college and learn something. And, and what, what did you actually do? I mean, you talk about the need for the people who live there right. to be actually involved in the planning and implementation of the solution and allowed to come back and live there. What did you actually do and what was some of the actions and lessons you learned? Uh, you know, in, in that work. I know it's a success yeah. story now, but it doesn't just sure. happen. No, the irony was like in the late 70s or so, you know, like uh, the ur uh, urban, you know, urban national park came to Lowell in mm -hmm. the late, early 80s, you know, there was a, it had been talked about for a while, and now all of a sudden Lowell was going to be this focus, you know, it had been this dying city, kind of a mill city, that, that plan had never worked for the people, and but now there was going to be this urban national park, so all of a sudden, uh, I knew from that whole experience and what I had learned in school about how these things work, that all of a sudden the people, who, the poor people who lived around downtown where all of these new changes were going to be coming, when, you know, uh, the prop, you know, buildings were let to go for a number of years, 
that now that land was valuable and mm. now they were vulnerable and I could sense, oh, is there going to be another plan coming that's going to want to remove mm. people out of here? And you started to see inklings about that. So I started to ask questions about that. You know, what, what's, what's the plan? What's the plan? And everybody was just like coy and, 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 and uh, it was clear something was going on but nobody wanted to talk about it. But this time, I had known from the experience, my own experience, and uh, As a that kid, this could right. happen. Yeah. And so um, we started to see arson fires start to happen in the Acre neighborhood, which, which bordered right on that area. And we could sense that something was happening. There was, people were being, like, leaving. Anybody who could afford to leave were wanting to get out because they were afraid they were going to die in a fire at night if they didn't. So it was only the poor, so the poor that were left. And, uh, but these are people who really wanted to stay in the neighborhood. And it was primarily a Puerto Rican neighborhood at the time. It was a Latino neighborhood, uh, which I happened to live nearby. And, and uh, you know, I was in public housing right next door to it. And then all my friends lived there. Uh, and, and so I, I said, you know what happened to me in Little Canada? And I told the story. Now it's being aimed at you. Hmm. And, and, you know, th this is an opportunity to do something about this, you know, and, and we organized the, 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 to stop this plan. And how did you do that? What was like the first well, thing you we did? Well, basically we had to convince people this was going to happen, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because it sounds like this highfalutin plan, right. gentrification, you know, well, you can't come in with work terms like that. Mm -hmm. We basically, we finally got the city so angry because we kept uh, getting in all the national stories that came in on Lowell's revitalization and started saying, yeah, but what about uh, the acre? You know, what about the poor people in the acre? So we finally got the city manager at the time, who was somebody like Trump is now, basically, who was just like a, you know, uh, uh, an egotist. So you, we, we got under his skin enough that he kind of like blurted out and admitted that they were planning to take down that neighborhood. And how did you do that? How did you get By under getting, his skin? Because we were in the uh, Good Morning America would come and do a story on Lowell and it was supposed to be this great story about it, what an amazing revitalization it is. But then it'd have this little butt about uh, we'd get on camera and say and we'd be talking about well in fact uh, it's not so great in the acre, you know, to take well, all the money how, on it. Sorry, from Trump, how did you get that? How did you get on Good Morning America? I mean, that's not such an easy thing to do. Well, the first thing was well, we actually got a new Newsweek first. Uh, and it's because we had this uh, reporter, Charles Glass, at the time, who ended up working for ABC and then, uh, uh, a number of years later. But uh, he came through and he said he actually found us out because I had worked mm. with a group called Fair Share before that, which was right. an organizing group. Yeah. And he got the sense that something was up because he was he called it a dog and pony show. He was being led so effectively from one person to another about what a great story law was. that He thought there must be another side to this. And then he found out about... Uh, about us because we had been fighting, uh, you know, some of the issues about arson in the city, and and uh, he came in and he did a story, like he did a little paragraph about us, and that just gave us the legitimacy mm. um, to start getting into all the other national stories when they came into the city, and we became um, uh, an irritant to the city manager who blew his top and admitted that they were coming. That it even shows in that film Tully to raise an acre uh, triangle. Uh, so we were able to go to people door to door. So we had a team, Spanish and English uh, team of people going to, uh, door to door, literally every house in there to let people know, do you know this is coming? And it's coming primarily because, you know, uh, uh, they, they wanted, uh, there was a plan that they wanted to remove the Puerto Rican community out of the city. They wanted to sanitize, you know, uh, for tourists. They wanted to make it a, like, uh, you know, a nice white middle class area. They, you know, it was a clearly racist plan that they were. Uh, they wanted to clear that Puerto Rican neighborhood out. Like in our past, they wanted to clear the French Canadian community out at the time. So we basically went door to door, and we got people to to fight back against this. And, and, and who was going door to door? Well, we got the. Uh, Basically, my friends, uh, you know, people I, like, who live there, you know, not people, like yeah. out of towners. No, my, people, my friends, you know, I right. had you Makes know, my, a my Puerto right? Rican friends, my white friends. Basically, we had we put teams together to show that we were all united, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, against this. And and there were some even Greek old Greek families there. I remember going through at the time. There was a woman who was about eighty years old, and when we told her what was going to happen, her daughter was with her, who was probably like fifty. And she had lived there all of her life because it had been a Greek neighborhood primarily before. And you remember her saying to me at uh, one point, 
oh, if this happens, I'm going to die. I, I, you know, I've lived here all my life. It'll kill me if they move me out of here. Mm. And I knew that she wasn't kidding because of my, my, my Rose's experience, because there were a number of other people that it happened to. So that, you know, <laughs> gave us a determination to, to fight uh, pretty strongly about that. And we got people like Father Oban and, and the church you see in there, the pastor, uh, rest his soul, he's, he's no longer with us, he, a great man, but he was involved with a church that had not done nothing to stop Little Canada from being destroyed. In fact, they'd probably been on the side of some of the developers back then. He knew the history. He wasn't involved with it then. But he felt an obligation to make sure that right. that never happened again. And he, you know, he put the institution behind us uh, when they were trying to dismiss us as a bunch of local radicals and, and, and everything else, you know. And, and, uh, you know, he was some, you know, we started to organize people like that, friends that had some influence that wouldn't back us up uh, uh, while we were trying to buy right. time. Uh, right. So what would you it. say, you know, if you look, looking back on it and the Coalition for a Better Acre or CBA is still around and very vibrant, what are some of the lessons you would want to pass on to younger people, whether they're involved in urban renewal or any kind of ur organizing, whether it's urban or rural or wherever? Well, I, again, I think the, the lesson is like you take a look at the experience of Little Canada where people weren't involved in the planning process, then it didn't work for their benefit. It would work mm -hmm. for somebody else's. So if you're serious about trying to revitalize a community for all of the residents and not just for the most powerful, then you involve the people who are going to be the most impacted by right. that. Right, like planet. you say you, in right. the movie, like you say you do. And as and we did when them. we got yeah. in there, when we were able to get the funding, we created a community development corporation, which is what Coalition for a Better Acre is. Right. Which, which, which involves all the people in the planning uh, of how we develop all the buildings in the neighborhood. People have, uh, you know, we, we have people, you know, explain uh, the process of, of how you develop and everybody, you know, was able to, to be included in the planning process. So that mm -hmm. neighborhood worked to the benefit of everybody. Nobody got displaced. That was our, our, our slogan, was revitalization without displacement. Right, I saw the sign in the yeah, movie. Yeah, we right. were determined. Nobody's going to be removed from here. Right. If you're serious, if Lowell's serious about revitalizing this community for all of its residents, um, then the residents are going to have to be involved with that planning process and, and, and nobody's going to be impacted. And we were able to do it. Uh, nobody was displaced. We were able to develop that housing, and then later on, North Canal Apartments, we found out right. were, were about years. to be thrown yeah, out. Right. 267 units were going to be lost, and the same issue was at place, but because we succeeded in developing the Acre Triangle, and we now had a track record, we went in there and we stopped another development plan that was going to come in and just turn it into market rate housing. Right. Uh, Which was actually built on Little right. Canada. It was actually built, it was supposed to be the replacement housing for Little Canada, which was built five years after we were removed. Uh, and it was done by lousy developers who basically let the place run down, had you know, holes in the ceiling before the person mo even moved in. It was designed to fail, and that's one of the biggest issues that we had is that we got, how'd they turn it over to us for a dollar? Because we had to do $20 million of renovation wow. to be able to, to keep uh, uh, that place, you know, uh, not only affordable, but quality housing for the right. people who live there. And so we were able to preserve that with the ten by creating a tenant council uh, in North Canal. Uh, all the tenants were involved with the planning uh, uh, and, and the process and, and not one person was removed. And, and it still no, remains as really, uh, low-income housing no, for the and people I appreciate today. That. And, you know, so the combination of building a coalition for a better acre and your book, Told Through the Eyes, you know, almost now, what is it, 60 years ago almost, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, through the eyes of a 13-year-old. And the, uh, your book, which is coming out soon, Farewell Little Canada by Loom Press in Lowell uh, in the spring of 2022. I think that's a great combination to... Uh, for people to learn what it's actually like for real people to go through this process of, quote, urban renewal, and also what it's like to actually have to build a successful community development corporation as Coalition for a Better Acre Still Alive now is working. And I think that's um, a really important story. And uh, I'm really glad you took the time not only to write it, but also to build CBA Charlie. and. Uh, 
So, you know, we have some important lessons there, and I'm really glad you were able to come on uh, this this little program. We hold these truths. So, <laughs> well, my uh, pleasure. Thank you for having no, me. No, well, we're really honored to have you here, and uh, so uh, we're really glad to have Charlie Gargiulo, author of Farewell Little Canada, his book about growing up in uh, Little Canada in Lowell, Massachusetts, and what that did, and how it affected real people. And I hope you'll take the time to uh, watch the video about the Coalition for a Better Acre, uh, which tells the story of uh, building a community uh, that was about to be displaced that brought in the involvement and the voices of the people who live there so they could continue to live there, build a neighborhood, and not be displaced. So thanks a lot, Charlie. It's great to see you again. Thanks, Michael. And, uh, Hope you'll uh, tune in next week or whenever we have this show again. And thanks a lot for coming, Charlie.